Okay, so I'm hoping that you guys can see my screen now. Yep, we can see your screen. Perfect. That looks great. And let me just um, officially introduce you so we can uh, get that on the recording as well. Um, all right, so I think um, for, for folks who've been in this group for a while, um, I, I think um, you have heard us talk about this project maybe once or twice before. Um, you know, at ASAP we have this pretty significant data set of over 500 jobs and counting that have been advertised between 2015 and now. Um, and while, of course, the primary purpose for collecting that data um, was so that we could put it on our jobs and opportunities board and have folks from within the climate adaptation community or folks who are um, looking to join the climate adaptation community could find those opportunities. Um, it's also just a really valuable data set to show how the adaptation field is advancing. And we've been for a while now um, wanting to do something with this data. Um, we did work briefly with uh, a researcher at the University of Vermont, uh, Jonathan Dowd, who did some initial analysis on that data for us. Um, that was already, I would say, 18 months ago. Um, and of course, uh, the volume of jobs is increasing um, as the field matures. And so we get, you know, obviously more and more jobs each week. Um, so we felt like we really needed to set up um, a searchable database where, that we could uh, quickly run analysis from. Um, right now, as Sarah will describe, um, we haven't put it anywhere super sophisticated yet. Um, we like to use the word database because it sounds fancy. But at the very least, um, I'm really excited to report that we now have a way to really access and transform this data and analyze this data in a way that's gonna tell us, um, tell us something um, and hopefully lots of things about where we are as a profession um, and where we need to go, uh, where the opportunities are um, and where we need to expand opportunity. And we are so grateful um, to have been able to use Sarah's talents this semester um, as part of her capstone project. Um, Sarah just graduated from the University of Michigan with a bachelor's of engineering in climate sciences and impacts engineering. Um, and she'll be earning her master's of engineering in applied climate next spring, also from the University of Michigan, um, after which she'll be enrolled in Columbia University's Master of Arts in Climate and Society program. Program. Um, and she hopes after graduation to begin a career translating and communicating usable climate information to inform public policy formation and other pressing issues. I'm going to chat Sarah's email address um, so that folks can get in touch with her um, outside of this presentation as well. Um, and then with that, I will turn it over to Sarah to walk us through the work that she's done. All right. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Rachel. I really appreciate it. Um, also, I apologize if there's any background noise. My apartment complex decided uh, that today would be a great day to do some construction right outside my window. Um, so let's get started. So the project scope and um, background to uh, this project, Rachel gave a very good description of, you know, why we wanted to create this database. And so um, really it was to discover how different adaptation employment opportunities um, are changing over time and kind of, you know, what this field is, is developing into. And so the process that we went through is to get all of the previous newsletters in one place and, um, you know, pull the, the jobs from the newsletters and implement them into a spreadsheet that has um, various columns for different information um, pulled from each job and then what we did is we collaborated with ASAP staff to develop um, a few qualitative coding schemes that we could use to analyze the job descriptions um, and pull some data from that. And then of course we coded the data according to these schemes and performed some data analytics. And I implemented some metadata inside the spreadsheet to help um, people in the future um, code the data um, according to, you know, uh, how I did it for consistency sake, um, as well as to understand um, kind of how, how this uh, spreadsheet works. 
So first in um, uh, pulling the jobs from the newsletters, we wanted to make sure that they were in accordance with the job board guidelines that ASAP has. So we would search uh, for climate adaptation or climate resilience in the job title or the job description. Um, and if those weren't there, then we would search for terms like preparedness planning, impacts, climate equity, et cetera. We'd also see uh, who submitted the, the job posting, whether it was an ASAP member or whether it was a company or some other organization and whether, you know, ASAP had previous experience with uh, this organization. And then we also looked for different red flags. Um, so for example, any research that excludes action, practice, or applications we would throw out, um, as well as any opportunities that are exclusive to mitigation, energy efficiency, broad sustainability, things like that. Uh, really things that, that didn't have much to do with um, adaptation. And then, of course, in this uh, list, it's not all encompassing. We did have to uh, make some exceptions. So for example, um, uh, some criteria varied by position level. Um, you know, a more senior position that, that had um, uh, some responsibilities relating to like climate mitigation and energy efficiency and things would be okay, um, as opposed to in a more intermediate position that would not be. And then we also had to take into account um, the fact that adaptation is a uh, very privileged field. And so we had to kind of adjust our, um, our process to account for this by realizing that frontline and vulnerable communities may not include these keywords, but we still wanted to include them in this process and in this database. So like I said, the first thing that we did is gather and clean data. And as Rachel said, we have data from January 2015 all the way until February 2020, and that's 654 jobs total. And so this picture here is just an example of what the jobs look like um, pulled straight from the newsletter. So we have the job title in blue and underlined. We have um, the employer to the left in the next line under, and then we have the location um, to the, the right of the employer with the, job, with the job description below. So then what we did is we took this job description and we pulled um, a bunch of information from these job descriptions into um, a spreadsheet that had columns for each of these categories. So uh, we recorded the, the job title, publication date, um, the, the job ID, just to count how many jobs we had and to line them up with the coding schemes in the future. We also classified each job according to a position level, depending on what the description or the job title says. Um, same thing with the type of employment and the length of employment. Um, the employer is, is listed and the same thing with the location. And then we also classified um, each of these jobs by sector, depending on who the employer was. Uh, we also took down the job description, as well as the link to the, the job posting or um, the organization's page, if it was live. Um, and then we also recorded, um, the last two bullets here relate to the coding schemes that we developed. Um, which is the step in the adaptation process that the job is, uh, as well as the categories of action or, or kind of what this job is contributing in terms of climate adaptation. And so this is just a screenshot of what the archive looks like right now, just to kind of give you guys an idea of how this is all set up. We have one sheet with all of the raw data, and then we have the next sheet over, which includes the metadata. So going into the metadata, it explains the purpose of each column that I just showed. Um, and it also gives directions for future users on how to properly classify and code the data um, should they need to in the future. And uh, it also provides the code definitions in order to, to make this a little bit easier. And so this is, uh, again, a screenshot of what the metadata looks like. We have the column name, 
uh, which corresponds to the column name in the database. And then we have the explanation of the column, basically, you know, what that column is. And then I have a uh, how to classify section um, for um, columns like um, position level, uh, length of employment, and things like that, so that um, people kind of know my, my rationale on, on how I, I decided these classifications. And then to the right, we see um, the different uh, code families and children codes that we applied, as well as the code definition so that people can use that as a reference. So going into our coding schemes that we developed, the first one that we used was from EcoAdapt's Ladder of Engagement. And so this is the adaptation process code family. And there's a, a, a small schematic on the right side of your screen that kind of details um, the different steps and where they relate in the adaptation process. And so the first rung is awareness, you know, being aware of the problem and recognizing that there is a problem. And then, um, you know, there are higher levels of engagement from that, that first rung of the ladder. Um, and then moving on to what our second coding scheme is. This is from the ASAP Living Guide, and this is categories of action. And as I said before, this kind of goes more into detail about um, what kinds of actions this job is taking to um, further adaptation and, and you know, where it, it relates to in terms of uh, what the action is producing. Um, so just for some rough metrics, from our coding schemes. Um, this is for adaptation, the adaptation process code family on the left. Um, there are a significant number of jobs that are in the assessment and the, the planning stages, um, as well as integration. Uh, however, through discussions with Rachel, we decided that that number is a little bit high. And so I will probably have to revisit um, how I'm applying that code and making sure that I am applying that code uh, in the proper context. And then moving on to the categories of action code family on the right hand side, we can see that a lot of these jobs are um, in the measure and learn category as well as communicate and engage. Um, and so what, what these really detail is uh, jobs that are going out and, and taking measurements and um, doing more of the analytical uh, side of, of how um, climate change is affecting their communities and then com communicating and engaging is really um, about engaging stakeholders and the relevant audiences in this process of adaptation to make sure that they're being included uh, where they need to be. And so this is um, the same data that we just saw just in terms of percentages just to give um, another method of visualization. Um, but the, the conclusion is pretty much the same. Um, for the adaptation process, the majority of the jobs are in assessment and planning. Um, and then categories of action, the majority of the jobs are in communication and communicate and engage as well as measure and learn. Um, and it's important to note that uh, one job description um, could be classified or could have multiple um, codes assigned to it um, for each family. And so, um, if you do the math, that's, that's why there's not only 600 um, data points here. Um, and so now what we did is we used the available information that we classified from um, the spreadsheet to do some other basic data analytics. So um, on the left, you have um, position level. And so this is senior, intermediate, entry, and unknown. I used unknown because um, there were some job descriptions there were some uh, job entries that didn't have a description or uh, were too vague to classify. And so instead of you know, trying to, to do my best with it, I just kind of put it in an unknown category uh, to preserve the integrity of the data. Um, so as we can see, a lot of the jobs are in the intermediate level, though I would say it's a relatively, uh, a relatively good spread between um, the three position levels. And then I also classified all the jobs um, by year to kind of see, again, how this was changing over time as is, you know, kind of the whole point of this project. Um, so of course there are only 32 data points in 2020 because we only went until February. 
Um, but so far, the trend shows that adaptation jobs are definitely on the rise uh, as time continues. And I, I uh, anticipate that trend to keep going as we move into 2020 and beyond. Um, so now we classified the different jobs by the sectors that they were in. And you can see all of the sectors um, on the x-axis here. Um, a lot of the jobs were um, relating to nonprofits or for-profit companies, um, academic institutions, and that includes things uh, uh, like sea grant programs because they're housed in academic institutions. Um, and then we also have a pretty significant number of jobs available in local government and uh, a moderate amount in um, state, international, and federal governments. Um, and so moving on to the next analysis, um, we did jobs by type and length of employment. And so we have type of employment on the left. Most of them are full-time and uh, a handful of them are part-time and internships. Um, and then the length of employment, you have kind of the same thing. Um, the majority of them are permanent positions. And then we have a handful that are contracted and, and a handful that are temporary, including internships, uh, fellowships that are on a time limit and things like that. And so finally, what we did is we organized all the job opportunities um, by location. And in this case, um, I did it in a, in a breakdown of states. And so these numbers here indicate how many job opportunities are located in that state. And uh, if you look towards the Maryland area, it's a little bit difficult to see. Um, but there is uh, 17 jobs available in Maryland and 94 in Washington, D.C. And so I just wanted to make that distinction. Um, but for the most part, just giving this an initial scan, it looks like um, a lot of these jobs are located in places, as we expected, that are already or will soon feel the effects of climate change, especially those that are in our coastal areas. And then there are also a handful of jobs that were international, um, including places like uh, Canada and Ontario and Bangladesh. So in conclusion, um, again, just giving an overview of what the process was like for this project, um, we organized and cleaned the data into various categories, as you saw in the spreadsheet, and that includes things like position level, location, type of employment, sector, et cetera. And then we coded data according to these developed coding schemes um, which is what step they were in the adaptation process as well as the categories of action. And then we used um, the simple data analysis techniques and the results that I showed um, to determine the state of adaptation jobs and how they are um, progressing and, and what they look like. And so some takeaways from this, this project is, of course, as is with the coding schemes, is that adaptation is not a one size fits all project. Um, or, or a one-size-fits-all process. Um, there are multiple levels um, to adaptation that a job or um, organization could be working towards at any given time. And this also gave me a really good insight into um, qualitative coding methodology because you know, I've, I've um, gotten my feet wet in that a little bit, um, but this definitely gave me a much more um, comprehensive experience. And so um, I was able to learn how to use Deduce and learn a new software. And so learning is always good. Um, so in terms of future work, we definitely plan on integrating a time series analysis with some of the variables that I mentioned before, um, as well as some better graphics, including some relational diagrams to display um, how some of these classifications in the coding schemes relate to one another. So that's all I have. Um, as Rachel said, she put my email in the Zoom chat. I also have it on the presentation here in case you'd like to write it down or if you have any questions uh, outside of this meeting. And so with that, I thank you and I open it up to questions and discussion. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was awesome. Um, we're gonna do any sort of any Q&A um, specifically for Sarah for a few minutes here and then um, we'll move into more of a guided discussion about what we want to do next with this data and potential future analyses. So questions for Sarah. Um, that, this is Ricky and I, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, one of them is very practical and it 
it, this is an opportunity for the group, but but also for Sarah, is that yesterday um, the College of Engineering at Michigan asked me what is what are the job titles that people in applied climate should be searching for um, if they're they're looking for a job, and in particular they were looking at some database that they use, and um, in short, I didn't have a really good answer because of the statistics and um, that, that we have. So I was wondering if, if there were job titles that were the most prominent, uh, what would they be at this point? That's a really interesting question. And unfortunately, I don't think I have a very good answer for that either, um, just because of uh, the sheer spread of jobs that there were. Um, there were some common threads that I noticed that, um, you know, employers usually had like climate planner or, you know, resilience specialist or, you know, things like that, that directly relate to climate change. Um, so I would probably say that uh, if you're just looking at job titles alone, that something uh, regarding um, you know, something that, that has the word climate or resilience or basically um, anything that follows the, uh, the guidelines, the ASAP job board guidelines, specifically um, what they're looking for in terms of adaptation, I would say that's a very good resource to use. Um, in terms of mitigation, because we didn't really focus on that in this project, unfortunately I can't speak to that. Um, but I would say that while job title is important, I would say that the job description is more important um, about, about deciding what jobs to apply to and to kind of get a sense of, um, you know, what you'll be doing in the job and, you know, what kind of activities you will be putting your effort towards. Okay. Um. Thank, thank you, and I, I've presently forgot my other question, so I'll, I'll, de, I'll defer and see if it comes back while other people are talking. I have a question, and maybe those of you who have been involved longer already know this as general knowledge, but I'm curious, do we have a sense for how many of these positions are essentially newly created activities versus um, kind of reframing existing um, positions that are now having to also take into account adaptation, if that makes sense. <laughs> I think I know I, what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, I, I ran into that a couple times. And so one thing that we did in this job analysis is we made sure to um, not include any duplicates. Um, so, you know, say there were two or three or how many newsletters that, you know, had the same job posting multiple times, you would only um, include it in the database once. But something interesting that I did come across um, was that occasionally if the same position was spaced like a few years apart, um, the description would be the same, but the job title would change to um, reflect um, you know, increase awareness and engagement in the adaptation process. Um, and you bring up a good point. I, I didn't record any metrics for that, but I think it would be interesting to maybe go back and, and look at to see, um, again, like you said, how, how these are changing and, you know, whether these organizations are changing it um, more in terms of, of, you know, looking good or, uh, whether they actually um, kind of mean what they say in terms of um, preparing for adaptation and, and helping others prepare for adaptation. When, I'll just chime in with one other data set that we do have or that we are starting to um, develop, which is actually asking that question directly of ASAP members on the state of the adaptation profession um, section of the ASAP member survey. So we only will have two years of data for that. Um, this is our second year, but we do have that question. Yeah, I think it would be interesting metric to understand how much of is shifting within 
And of course the baseline is now shifting, of course, but um, shifting within ex long existing types of positions and activity sets versus additional as the growth of the field actually grows. And then sort of a related question is, it'd be really interesting to know what the main funding drivers are for that. Um, you know, kind of the breakdown that that's, that's getting into the nitty gritty of, of where funding for, for, you know, FTEs comes from, but that would be interesting to know over time as well. I'm seeing a couple of raised hands. Let's go to Frank and then to Nick. Uh, this is a really important um, uh, body of work here. So, so thank you for the analysis. Um, one, another way of looking at this is I'm kind of trying to look at what the carrying capacity of this work is. And the way I would look at it is, um, you know, if you connected the jobs to say their scope of work, so X person works for county, another one works for city, you know, what is the, what is the, the scope of that and what is the population size of, of that? And then try and extrapolate out what a fully, um, you know, how many jobs do we need for the nation? in this area, each of these areas versus how many, because the, the trend is one thing. And then what's the total number that is necessary in order for climate adaptation planning, communication and engagement, you know, all of it to be working across the geography because, you know, some places you're going to need one person and it's going to cover a large geography and some places you're going to need a, a large number in a small geography. But um, I think some, extrapolation or just some thoughts about how you would go from this current analysis to what, um, especially with somebody like yourself, who's going into a program that generates professionals that would take some of these jobs in the future. I think you would want to know how many, and I'm looking at it as how many people do we need um, on, a, on some periodicity to, to do this work. And then the second, second uh, question to that is, um, you know, the, the trend data, I, I'm, I'm curious about whether or not the 2020 trend is going to shrink or, right, like, you know, that, that, that back, there it is. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that 2020 is going to be anywhere near 2019, given that a lot of the funders probably just saw their economic uh, resources shrink. And maybe it's not in 2020, but it might be in 2021. And then it'll come back in, in some time. I don't know. Any, any, that's just a hypothesis. You know, I, there's no data to support that one way or the other. No, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that you do bring up a good point because in this analysis, this doesn't really account for, um, you know, any external factors, you know, like a, a pandemic happening and crippling uh, the world economy. And so I think that is an important <laughs> caveat to to take into account for future analysis for you know this year and however many years that it it takes in order for the economy to recover and you know different organizations economies to recover and their funding and whatnot um so yeah i i, I think that you bring up a very important point in that regard and then to your other question about um, the number of jobs needed in an area, we did a little bit, we sort of touched on it um, in this graph when we separated them by sector. Um, so we separated them not only in terms of like local, state, and international governments, but also um, regional entities or multi-state governments or entities that worked across states. Um, sort of as like a, a coalition. And so there were a number of jobs that um, were located in a given state, but worked towards the goals of um, a coalition. And a, one specific example that, that comes to mind is, I think it was a job in, in Delaware or something that um, mainly was contributing to keeping the state's promise in the uh, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative or REGI. Um, and, and basically finding ways to, um, you know, adapt the current state infrastructure in order to accommodate um, these goals that, that, the state, that the state had set out for itself. Um, but you, you are correct in that, you know, more populous areas will, will probably need um, a much larger adaptation workforce as opposed to more rural areas or, you know, areas that 
um, are not, I guess, as vulnerable um, to climate change or to the effects of it. Um, but I, I think, at least uh, with my knowledge and my experience, I think that metric of how many how many jobs are needed is is difficult to calculate. Um, and so we would need to, to do some research and, and look into, um, uh, you know, the, the best methods available to try and uh, evaluate that metric. Let's go to Nick. Thanks. So uh, I apologize if you said this earlier because I got bumped out of a call and also because I have a three-year-old on my lap. <laughs> no problem. Did, um, did you take a look at the ONET codes to see what categories um, these fall into in terms of the Department of uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, like uh, for all of these different ones, if they fall into any specific ONET categories? Um, I did not, and I'm going to be honest with you, I really don't know what that is. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, <laughs> and so um, that might be something that we could evaluate in this project going forward. Uh, of course, um, the, the amount of data analysis and stuff here might, might seem comprehensive from the amount of, of graphs and figures that I have, but um, this is just a start to this project, and so um, we can always add on to it later. Oh no, I, I think it's a really, I think it's really fantastic work. Um, then the thing you might be interested in, and so ONET is, it's like O with an asterisk and then NET. It's mm -hmm. what the um, Bureau of Labor Statistics, I think, believe, I believe uses in terms of identifying like core competencies and what job positions actually do. And so for a lot of the positions you describe, they may have corresponding ONET codes, but why that becomes really important is then for college and university or community college like workforce education and training, a lot of times they try to target the specific ONET codes um, to make sure that they have key competencies. And so it may just be an interesting area that you want to look into, you know, based on these job descriptions. Like if it's for a planner, you know, does the planner actually, um, the planner ONET code actually reflect, you know, some of the, the things that, you know, that position would want the person to have related to climate adaptation. So, but yeah, now that, now that you explain it, it makes a lot more sense. <laughs> and um, Nick, I'll just chime in here and say that we have a goal of getting ONET codes up for climate change adaptation and climate resilience professionals, which I think in which would which stems specifically from the knowledge and competencies framework effort um, and would then feed into how we go about classifying jobs. So I think we're thinking about it almost from the opposite perspective in a way, um, but absolutely looking to kind of get those up and running actually rather than using existing codes, although I think that is a really ripe area for future discussion. Yeah, there are a lot of professionals though, like civil engineers, and architects, and you know, others who are doing climate adaptation work. So I think in some cases there's building entirely new ONET codes, but in other places there's about you know, making climate adaptation a core competency in some of these other professional mm -hmm. fields, so. Absolutely, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I think I have Maria next, oh. and then Ricky. Okay, um, this was a great analysis, um, congratulations. So one of my questions is, um, or as a follow-up that you could think of is, um, uh, surveying the people who um, submitted these job positions and finding out um, did they get what they were looking for, you know, just to try to figure out what those gaps in competencies were, you know, because not everybody gets exactly what they're looking for. And so, um, and that would inform, you know, um, programs or um, educational institutions. And then sort of uh, going um, back to the ONET code, um, there is, um, um, have you used burning glass, Rachel? Um, so burning glass is a, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's um, labor market intelligence, and I am sure somebody at the at the University of Michigan has burning glass, and they would lend you their license to um, repeat your keywords minus your um, codes that you don't want included, sort of like you know the mitig the mitigation stuff and see if there's a broader group of 
you know, I mean, is everybody in the adaptation field coming to you to, they're, no, they're not. They're putting it on other sources too. So maybe you get a, even a larger um, population of jobs and you, can, and you can search for that time period exactly and your same keywords and everything. And um, so that's a burning glass. And then the other idea is um, career pathways, you know, showing, being able to map those so young people know what they, what they can plan for. Yeah, I think the university actually already uses career pathways. Um, I'd have to double check on that. And so I might have access to that. Um, but yeah, I, with uh, your question and the, the previous question, a lot of what I'm hearing is, you know, what kind of skills are, um, you know, these employers really looking for in order to satisfy these adaptation, you know, job requirements. And so, pardon my cat in the background. Um, and so that's, that's one thing that we really wanted to do in this project. Unfortunately, we didn't really have the time to do that analysis, but I completely agree with, with what you guys are saying that it's, it's a very important metric to look at going forward. And I really appreciate all the resources that you guys are giving us. And Ricky, I think you had your hand up as well, right? Yes. Um, so I remembered my other question and, and again, it's probably outside the scope of this, but well, I know it's outside the scope of this particular project. Um, has there been any effort to look at the United States versus Europe um, on, on the categories and, and the number of jobs in this field? And I, I ask because I do provide my students with lists, links to job lists, and I've noticed there are a whole lot more, there seem to be many, many more jobs in Europe and Australia and, and, and a number of other places. I was wondering if there's any quantitative analysis at this point. Um, not explicitly. Um, the only sorts of jobs outside of the US that I have access to are the ones that were provided um, through the, the, um, the newsletters. Um, but yeah, I, again, I think that would be a really interesting metric to look at. Um, I'm not sure how um, it would necessarily fit into the scope of this project, but that's something we could uh, discuss with Rachel at a later date. But I do think that the uh, cultural and societal implications of the availability of adaptation jobs and, you know, kind of gleaning from that where adaptation is valued the most on a global scale um, I think that would be something that is interesting to look at. Well, thank you so much, um, Sarah. This is really um, such an incredible foundation that you've built for ASAP and for the field to um, undertake some of the analysis that folks on this call are suggesting. Um, we're really, really grateful for your time and efforts. Uh, congratulations on graduating. We're so glad that this could be your capstone project. Um, and we're, we're excited about um, the possibilities for where to take this. Um, so we have about two minutes left in the meeting here. Um, and I'd love for folks to um, just take a minute to enter into the chat. What's a burning question that you'd like to see answered by either this data set or um, you know a follow-on data collection or analysis effort that's uh, related to this jobs data set. Um, so go ahead and type that in if you'd like and then we'll do a quick meeting evaluation. All right, so while you're still typing into the chat, I'll just take um, two volunteers, maybe folks who haven't spoken yet, to share something you learned, something you liked, or something you'd like to see changed for next time. This is Beth. I really liked hearing this presentation from Sarah. Um, I think that it's it's fun to see work that we've been working on collecting for years um, kind of being developed into something that I think is going to be really usable by the 
field and by ASAP. So thank you, Sarah. I feel like I learned a lot and really, really enjoyed people's questions and the conversation around what you presented. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I really had a good time working on this and uh, I really enjoy looking forward to, you know, hopefully working on this project or another project with ASAP in the future. So thank you so much for all the opportunities. Awesome. Any other meeting evaluation comments before we close out? Take one more here. Mm -hmm. I know you all have opinions. Don't be shy. All right. Well, with that, we will close this meeting of the professional education group. Um, oh, Josh learned that uh, and was shocked at how the jobs are concentrated by state. Thanks, Josh. Um, so we'll close this meeting. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon or morning as the case may be. <clears throat> and we'll look forward to connecting again next month. Um, thank you all. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, Sarah. Thank you. I was nervous about it, so <laughs> I, I hope it went well. Yeah, it was really good. Um, and thank you so much for getting um, those other analytics together. And I thought the map was was perfect, a perfect way to visualize things, especially on short <laughs> notice. So yeah, that was really good. Good. Um, so I think that we have on, we're gonna, we'll try to convene a meeting soon. Um, so we can just chat about next steps. And, um, you know, in any event, I know we'll connect with you via the Glisa team. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else that you need for this project to like close things out for your capstone or anything like that? Or you uh, I don't think so. Ricky just, I mean, as you know, he, he sat in here and then he told me yeah. to send him the presentation. Um, okay. And yeah, I guess other, other than that, everything seems all good. But if we need anything else, I'll definitely really let you know. Okay, sounds good. And as you can see, there's obviously a lot more work to be done. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll just kind of see. I mean, we're really trying to get some um, dedicated funding for this work. Um, and, you know, that'll certainly um, have implications for our staffing structure and how mm -hmm. we staff this work going forward. Um, but I know that, you know, with the fall, we'll sort of come a, a new and a good structure for you to continue to engage. Um, it sounds like with or without funding. So that's really awesome and I, th I think there'll certainly be what to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to working with you in the future. Thanks, Sarah. It's been really wonderful. And if you could upload your presentation to the Google Drive also, if you yeah. haven't done that. Yeah, I'll do that right after we get off the call. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.